Hi, I'm Rahil Philippos and you are listening to Three Things the Indian Express News Show. In this episode we talk about the role of the governor and why many governors get into a row with the state governments. We also give you an update on the attack on the Indian consulate in the US by Khalistan supporters. But first we talk about the Indian army. For a while now the Indian army has been facing an acute shortage of mid and junior level officers like majors and captains in field units. And to address the issue, the army now plans to reduce the number of officers posted at various army headquarters and is instead going to appoint them to the field. In this segment, the Indian Express's Amrita Nayak Datta joins us to explain the army's plans, how they will work and how they're being received. So to start with Amrita, can you talk about the sort of postings that major and captain level officers generally get in the Indian army? So Rahil mid level officers in the rank of major are given their first exposure to staff appointments uh, which could be in different core uh, command and division headquarters on completion of around 6 years of service so a staff appointment generally refers to a uh, posting in a headquarter where the officer is handling different policy and coordination of various subjects as against a unit appointment now they are also posted in units where they are primarily responsible for operations and ground actions So yes they do get a staff appointment in which uh, they get exposure to various uh, policy roles and in the unit they are mostly responsible for operations okay and right now the army is considering reducing the number of majors and captains at the headquarters and sending more to the field can you tell us why that is So this is primarily because there is a shortage of officers in the army in general and uh, also officers at the major and captain levels and there's a shortage of nearly 8000 officers in the army including the army medical corps and the army dental corps and as a result uh, the army is thinking why not uh, exercise the option of posting more of them given that there is a shortage of posting more of them to units instead of staff appointments So there are two three options that the army is considering one is of course to reduce the number of uh, staff appointments in the headquarters and whatever appointments are there re-employed officers in the army they could be posted in this appointment so these are the two options that the army is considering and it has sought inputs from various commands on the feasibility of this move so it's not yet final Right. And you mentioned that re-employed officers might now get posted to these headquarter roles. Could you explain to us what exactly re-employed officers are and how these postings will work? Yes, re-employed officers are those who serve in the army for 2 to 4 years after their actual retirement from the service and they're mostly in the ranks of uh, brigadier and colonels. So when officers retire they can opt for reemployment and uh, if they meet the eligibility criteria they could be reemployed in these ranks so while they will don the same rank the retiring uh, rank the appointment in which they will serve will be one rank lower so if it is a colonel the appointment in which he will serve will be the appointment of a lieutenant colonel similarly if it is a brigadier the appointment in which he will serve would be that of a colonel so it is like that and there are about uh, 500 to 600 uh, reemployed officers in the army at present and reemployment is completely voluntary these options which are being considered by the army are not yet been finalized so these officers are much senior to the existing staff officers and some of them would already have held those appointments about 20 to 25 years ago so they can surely be uh, posted in select appointments that's one one official told me however as i just said rahel nothing has been finalized it's only in a discussion stage and once everything is sorted out then this could be done And Amrita do we know what the officers in the Indian army think about these plans So Rahel I did speak to a couple of officers and there is a mixed opinion about this some people feel that yes definitely officers in the rank of majors and uh, captains they should ideally be posted on in field units more than staff appointments because they should be there for operation and various on ground duties whenever needed However some people also feel that uh, cutting down staff appointments at this rank would reduce the exposure of officers to a significant level so when a officer is serving in a staff appointment he also gets the exposure of growing in the hierarchy because after a point the officer would be holding several critical appointments in various headquarters so it gives them them an exposure at a younger stage however reducing staff appointments at this stage would uh, deprive them of that exposure that is largely a lot of officers are feeling that way Thank you. 
And next, we talk about the role of the governor. Last week, Tamil Nadu Governor R. N. Ravi tested the constitutional limits of his position by dismissing a minister without the consent of the Council of Ministers. The minister in question was V. Senthil Balaji, who was recently arrested by the Enforcement Directorate for allegedly being involved in a job scam. Now, shortly after taking the call to dismiss him, Ravi actually had to put this decision on hold after the Home Ministry advised him to seek legal advice on the matter. But the initial call has once again brought to question the power of the governor and their frequent tussles with the state governments. In this segment, we are joined by the Indian Express's Apurva Vishwanath to talk about this issue. So, Apurva, in the past, we've often seen a tussle between governors and state governments. For example, in Bengal, uh, the former governor, Jagdeep Dhankar, had often been accused of acting at the behest of the central government. Similar accusations have been made at Arif Mohammad Khan in Kerala and, of course, R.N. Ravi himself. Could you talk about what usually lies at the heart of the tussle? So all of these are essentially the Raj Bhavan stepping into what is political arena. And you see this almost always happening in opposition rule states. And R.N. Ravi's decision last week was also in that line. About sacking a minister, this is something that Arif Mohammad Khan has said that he would be inclined to do this earlier, but had never been done because it is really against the letter of the constitution itself. So Arun Ravi's decision last week was pushing that line a bit further and he went ahead and issued orders to sack the minister. Right. And talk about what exactly is supposed to be the role of the governor. Where does it begin and what are its limits? Right. So with a reading of the letter of the constitution and what a line of Supreme Court decisions have emphasized again and again, The contours of these powers of the governor are very well defined. The governor is largely a ceremonial position, except for a couple of situations where the government can take independent decisions. But for everything else, the governor is bound by what we call the aid and advice of the cabinet of ministers. So in that sense, a number of day-to-day functions that the governor does is not independent really and that power is drawn from the fact that the ruling party commands the floor of the house. So as long as the ruling party has majority on the floor of the house, that is where the governor draws his powers from and the governor can only exercise these powers with the aid and advice of the chief minister. For example, take Article 164 of the Constitution, which talks about appointment of ministers. It says that the governor can appoint the chief minister. And then it says that the other ministers shall be appointed by the governor on the advice of the chief minister and the ministers shall hold office during the pleasure of the governor. But this phrase, the pleasure of the governor, is what, you know, we've seen Arif Mohammad Khan and even Arun Ravi in this case bring into focus. But so this phrase, the pleasure of the governor, is not really the whims and fancies of the governor. It is dictated by the aid and advice of the chief minister. And once the government is in function, it's not just the chief minister, but the council of ministers. So the literal meaning of the pleasure of the governor doesn't really hold because it has to be backed by the aid and advice of the cabinet. And even the phrase pleasure of the governor is really coterminous. That means it exists as long as the party enjoys power on the floor of the house. So if the party ceases to have majority, then it is automatically assumed that the pleasure of the governor is also gone, right? So this provision doesn't give the power for the governor to act on his own. Right. And besides this phrase, the pleasure of the governor, the other thing that sometimes gets pointed out is that the constitution lays down any provision for the way in which the governor and the state must act when there is a difference of opinion between the two. But how should we be viewing this argument or observation? So that's slightly incorrect to say that the constitution doesn't make room for this. The constitution lays out the role and function of the governor very clearly. In fact, we've had a very landmark seven-judge bench ruling of the Constitution bench in the Supreme Court. It's a 1974 ruling in uh, Shamsair Singh versus State of Punjab, where the court, again, very specifically says that the governor must exercise formal constitutional powers only upon and in accordance with the aid and advice of their ministers, save in very few well-known exceptions. And these well-known exceptions are 
again, something that we all know, the Sarkaria Commission makes a reference to this. This is, you know, when the governor has to recommend president's rule in the state or when the governor has to take notice that the government has fallen, that the party has lost majority on the floor of the house or a situation where the government has to invite a party to form the government. These are very few exceptions where the governor can take independent decisions. Also, that is because it is assumed that the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers does not exist in this situation. You know, the idea that President's rule has to be imposed comes from when there is a breakdown of constitutional machinery. And when there is a breakdown, the governor does not have the benefit of the aid and advice of the Cabinet of Ministers. Or, for example, when a party has lost power, right? If you have lost power in the eyes of law, then it is assumed that there is no aid and advice that is available to the governor. So these are exceptional situations situations are again well documented and very well known. So yes, the constitution might not take into account every political tug of war, right? It does not account for political tussles that are played out between constitutional authorities, but it is not correct to say that the constitution is unclear on this issue. Right. And could you talk a bit about the main structural factors that leads to the kind of tussle we've seen between governors and state governments? Right. So the structural factor remains that the governor is appointed by the president. Again, the president acts on the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers at the center. So the Raj Bhavan is essentially an agent of the central government in a state. And in a federal structure that we have in India, when you have differences of opinion between the ruling party in the center and the opposition party in the state, these things have been happening for many, many years now. So it is this structural issue that contributes to the Raj Bhavan becoming a political office. And the center in many instances in the past has used the Raj Bhavan in a political manner, whether it is about inviting a particular party to form the government after elections, or whether it was about imposing president's rule, like we saw in the case of Uttarakhand in the first term of the Modi government. So these are not uncommon things, especially on president's rule. We've had a long history of the governors misusing their office, dating back from the Indira Gandhi government, which led to the Supreme Court clarifying the law on this issue. And now you see that largely the president's rule issue is under control. You don't see governors stepping out of their roles when it comes to that issue. But you have newer arenas which keep getting tested every day. And in the end, we talk about an attack on the Indian consulate in the United States. On Sunday, a video was shared on social media by Khalistan supporters, which shows the Indian consulate at San Francisco being set on fire early in the morning. The fire was quickly doused by the San Francisco Fire Department and there were no major damages. Reacting to the attempted arson, US State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller wrote on Twitter and I quote, The U.S. strongly condemns the reported vandalism and attempted arson against the Indian consulate in San Francisco on Saturday. Vandalism or violence against diplomatic facilities or foreign diplomats in the U.S. is a criminal offense, unquote. Now, the video, which has the words, violence begets violence emblazoned on it, also features news articles about the death of Canada-based Khalistan Tiger Force Chief Hadeep Singh Nijjar. Nijjar, who was on India's list of most wanted terrorists and carried a cash reward of rupees 10 lakh on his head, was shot dead outside a Gurdwara in Canada last month. And shortly after his death, we spoke to Manraj Grewal Sharma, the resident editor of the Indian Express at Chandigarh, about Nijjar. Here is what Manraj had to say about him. So Nichir was the chief of Khalistan Tiger Force. So Khalistan Tiger Force is an offshoot of the banned terrorist organization called Babur Khalsa International. And the MHA had declared this terrorist organization. MHA has also banned KTF, Khalistan Tiger Force. So the main reason was they were spreading hatred against India and NIA in its charges, in its comments about the organization had said how it uses social media to influence people against uh, 
India and to create disharmony amongst different communities through hate speeches. So they had said that we have gathered substantive evidence to prove that he is uh, encouraging seditionary activities on the Indian soil. So even though he was in Canada, he was spreading a lot of hatred against India. And it wasn't that he rose to fame all of a sudden. So in Canada, there is a term called weekend Khalistanis. So not all the Gurdwaras are home to them, but there are certain Gurdwaras like the one which he was uh, presiding over and in whose parking lot he was shot dead. So they would uh, encourage a lot of conversation around this subject. And then, of course, the agencies believe that he was in touch with Pakistan and other agencies inimical to India. So he gradually rose up the ladder. So he got into these Gurdwara politics and we are told that he took over as president by some form of force. That is what the rival party says. That is how he became the president of this Gurdwara. So that kind of made gave him a lot of credibility as well as resources. And he used to always say that I am a humble plumber and that is how I earn my living. But uh, he made no bones about the fact that he was an advocate of Khalistan and he kind of took pride in it. Now, Sunday was not the first time the consulate was attacked. In fact, back in March, Khalistan supporters vandalized the consulate after the Punjab police had launched a massive crackdown against Amrit Pal Singh and his aides. And these attacks show that even though the Khalistan issue, which is the demand for a separate Sikh state, doesn't get a lot of support in Punjab, there are supporters for it abroad. And during the conversation on Nijjar, Manraj explained why that is the case. The BC Premier Ujjal Dosanjh, the first Indian to become the Attorney General in Canada and the first Indian to become the Premier. Last month, I think he was here in India. He was here in Chandigarh. And I was speaking to him about this issue. And he said something very interesting because he said, you want to feel relevant. You do not gel well where you go. So you live in a kind of time warp. So he was very blunt about it. So Khalistanis are people who want to feel relevant. They feel that here is this very mythical land and they are fighting for a cause. And if they get it, they will be happy. And because right now there is no sense of belonging. So even though they could be doing financially reasonably well, but somehow they have not been able to fully integrate into the new society. So this whole feeling, this whole need to belong, Dusanj told me that it is just a quest to be relevant and you remove this from them and they are not relevant any longer. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was hosted by me, Rahil Filipos, and written and produced by Ucha Sarmin, me, Rahil Filipos, and Shashank Bhargav, who originally spoke to Apurva for the second segment. It was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone who you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcasts at the rate indianexpress.com. 